who works in mixed media, textiles, raw earth pigments, natural dyes, acrylic paint and thread. Her work is abstract, reductive, contemporary, quiet and very tactile. Apparently simple, yet engaged with the complexity of ideas and practices. Her inspiration is drawn from wilderness landscapes, such as the Atacama Desert, New Mexico and the Arctic. Claire's work always starts with a piece of cloth. Stitching is her meditation, offering solace and stillness as she honours the cloth, feeling the texture of the fabric and raw earth pigment pigments stitch by stitch. Claire's work has been exhibited in galleries on an international scale across the USA, Europe and UK. In addition to the public exhibition program, her works feature in both commercial and private collections. Claire is an amazing tutor and has written many publications. Claire Ben values solitude, stillness and silence. So there's no surprise that she has thrived during lockdown, using this time for exploration and discoveries. I look forward to chatting with Claire tonight and getting an insight into not only her captivating work, but how we can all make better environmentally friendly choices as artists. Good evening. Good morning, Claire. Good morning. Good evening. <laughs> it's a little weird, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us all the way from the UK this morning for you. Um, and thanks for your generosity as well. You've sent through so many beautiful images and I can't wait to share them with people. They're just stunning. Pleasure. Yeah. How are things going in the UK over there at the moment? It's um, confusing would be the, the single word that answers that one. Uh, nobody seems to quite know what the rules are. Some people follow them. Some people don't. Um, Boris is, um, well, let's not go into that. I just, I'm very glad I don't live in America, though. So there you go. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's good. We're in Melbourne, which is mm -hmm. currently in stage four lockdown. So we're calling ourselves the Mexico of <laughs> Australia because we're south of the border and no one wants like not that no one wants to go to mexico but certainly um they're, keep, they're keeping us locked in that's Very for sure nice. <laughs> i know it's awful it's absolutely awful but um we're seeing the end in sight there's three weeks to go fingers crossed but who knows it's it's all that uncertainty isn't it yeah yeah, mm. yeah. certainly we are very lucky to live on uh we live in a in a little rural no it's not even rural we're just um in the suburbs but it feels quite rural because we're on a little bit of land and we're surrounded by state forest yeah. and yeah. i'm I, similar i i'm 10 minutes in either direction to a town but actually i could be in the middle of nowhere um yeah. i'm sorry if there's a buzzing noise um someone is cutting um wildflowers the wildflower meadow out oh. the front so um not much I can do about that. No, that's fine. We were um, did a test call yesterday, last night, and a big storm came through through Melbourne during that time. So we had chainsaws going all day today, people chopping their trees that have fallen down. <laughs> Wasn't very serene, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So on, on the subject of your beautiful property, yeah. you have a gorgeous home that you've built yeah. yourself with your, is it your husband? Yeah, we didn't really build it ourselves. We took over, um, well, I was actually looking to relocate all the teaching activity out of the house um, and well, the outbuildings of the house um, somewhere else. And we were having trouble finding that. And there'd always been this derelict barn down the end of the lane. So um, James and I kind of looked at it and went, well, we know we're not going to stay in this big house for the rest of our lives. We want something smaller and more eco. Wonder if we can get hold of it. So after a year of chasing the estate who owned the property, we um, managed to acquire it. And, and that after a little bit of cleanup work, believe it or not, that picture and uh, then we had to restore it to an agricultural building before we could apply for planning permission um, because it was derelict better said now nah, just let it fall down so we restored it to an agricultural building and then applied for planning permission to turn it into uh, a studio which classifies as light industrial and it's always easier to go from agricultural to light industrial 
and our long-term plan was to take it up to then residential, which, as you can see behind me, we've now actually managed to do. Uh, but it was a process. It was a process. But no, we had to have hardcore um, builders in to do the work because we dug a full basement underneath the barn, which you can't, you wouldn't know from looking at it from the outside. And that's given us two extra bedrooms, another bathroom, and uh, what we call the attic, even though it's underground. Um, wow. But it's delightful. It's just delightful. Yeah. This is an so image here of it as a studio, yeah? Yeah, that's of it as a studio. Um, so uh, Leslie and I were working in it that day. Up on the mezzanine is uh, John Stitzline, and right down the other end in the red apron is Nancy Crow. So the four of us got together and, and worked in the barn for a month, oh, a good few years ago now. But it was amazing space to work in. Yeah. But it's also an amazing space to live in, so... Yeah, no yeah, yeah. I'm slightly jealous, but <laughs> thank you so much for the um, the tip on going light industrial before you go residential. Because we were talking uh, before, and, and we've got a little property, and I'd love to somehow try and get some sort of accommodation, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I'd love yeah. to set it up as an artist residency. Actually, yeah. that that would be. Um, yeah. an ultimate goal and have it but have it as like an eco residency so yeah. you'd have the main hub and then you'd have little pockets of accommodation like whether they're shipping containers or mud brick homes or yeah. you know just single rooms where people could go and have that um that isolation while they're there as well I yeah. think because there's nothing worse than feeling on top of each other but um yeah you're I'm certainly an inspiration my husband, if they, can, can you hear that going on in the background oh he's just stopped no. now Oh, okay. No, I can't hear it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, all good. And this is a photo of uh, the barn as it as, is from the outside. As it is now. And interestingly, the sculpture you can see on the side of the barn, um, they're actually garden tools, which have the, the, the shape is out of lead, but they've been molded. Garden tools have been used to create the shapes. That's done by an artist called Charlie Paulson, who is Pauline Burbage's husband. Um, and they run the most, well, normally they run the most amazing studio up in uh, their property, which is on the, the border of Scotland and England. And um, he's a very gifted artist. Well, they both are. Yeah. Mm. Do you collaborate a lot with, with other artists in your area? No, not really. I mean, I used to be part of a group called View 7, um, and I did three or four joint exhibitions with them. And that's fine. Um but I, I, I don't know. I find collaboration hard because I've got I know what I want to make. And I think I would get really fed up if someone, you know, wanted to do something different to my vision. So, no, I don't collaborate much. I do open studios occasionally. Um, I'm in contact with other artists. But, um, no, don't do any collaboration. Mm. Oh, that's good. Lorna Crane says she's got barn envy. Barn envy. Yeah, me too, Lorna. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Carrie as well. Hi, Carrie. Morning. Yeah. Oh, no, evening. Evening. Yeah. Yeah. And Patricia, it's good to hear and see from you again. Absolutely. Yeah. Good yeah. Everyone, not, not that I ever get bad feedback about anybody, but everybody raves about you as a tutor. They really do. What do you think it is about the way you teach that resonates with people so much? Um, I think that because generally speaking, I don't, technique is important, of course it is, process is important, learning how to use different tools, mastering your media is really important because without understanding the media and the tools, it's very difficult to achieve what you want. But I, I think one of the reasons it works is my background is as a, you know, a trainer and a one-to-one -one coach. And I strongly believe that everybody has um, the ability inside of themselves to get where they want to be. So rather than me trying to sort of push information into people, it, it, it's for me about give, giving enough and then pulling information out of them. 
because all of us actually have the answers inside us, but a lot of the time we don't take enough time to do the problem solving that might be necessary, to do the sitting and staring at the work to figure out where to take it next. So my focus, what I want is people to be able to make their own work, what they've got in their heads, um, not necessarily, you know, what I want them to make. Um, and the other thing for me is to focus on very, very strong composition, uh, because that is the cornerstone of art. And I ran a workshop last week where it was quite hardcore. It was all about taking risks and trying to find new ground. And I sent them a load of questions to answer in advance um, about why they wanted to take these risks and so on and so forth. And probably 50% of the people wrote that they felt that their design process was flawed. And I'm like, well, Artists are not designers. They are artists. I don't know of a well-known artist, so whether that's Cy Twombly or Gerhard Richter or Agnes Martin, who designs their work. And I think, for me, this is one of the issues I have with City and Guilds, is that you've got to, in advance, make this plan for whatever it is you want to make, pour concrete around it so it is immovable and then try and execute it. And I'm sorry, art does not work like that. You know, yes, an artist might keep sketchbooks and, and, you know, map out a few rough ideas, but where, although we use craft in what we do, it's not the same as my husband trying to build a table where he'd have to have a plan. He'd have to know his measurements and, Blah, 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 blah. What we have is a vision. We see something inside our heads, which might be based on landscape, or it might be based on a pebble, um, or it might be based on some weird close up photograph we've taken of lichen on a rock. And we're trying to execute that. If we are familiar with our media, if we're familiar with the tools and what they can do with us for us, then we can sort of say to ourselves, okay, well, this is the color palette I need to use and roughly this is gonna be the order of my process. And you make a start. But I think making an artwork is what I would call a call and response. You do something and every action has an outcome or a consequence. So although you might have an idea of what your next thing might be, you can't be absolutely sure until you see the result of action number one. And you sit there and you look at it and you go, okay, still on plan. Um, now I'm gonna do this and you do action number two and that drives another result. So it's, it's very much a flow, I think, between the work as it evolves and your thoughts, your ideas, your responses to it as you watch it evolve. Um, so you're not designers, you're artists. You don't have to do an exact rendition on paper before you start. Plus, if you're working in textiles, I think it's pretty pointless working on paper, to be quite frank, because what you can achieve on, say, sketchbook paper is not what you can achieve on a piece of cloth, because a piece of cloth is absorbent. And I know a lot of people get really frustrated when they can't get the same brush mark on cloth as they can on paper. Well, no, you can't. Um, so if you're going to do sampling, my advice is sample as big as you can afford and sample on the cloth you're going to use because then you'll know what you're dealing with. Yeah, great advice. Yeah. 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 Madeline says spot on, Claire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we would you... all, I, I bet you any of us would, if we did something on paper and it didn't work out, we'd just screw it up and throw it in a bin. Piece mm. of cloth is like, oh, can't possibly do that. We have to get over the waste business. Um, we cannot make good work without wasting materials, media, time, effort. 
It's just not going to happen. And we have to remember that when we go to an exhibition, we're only seeing the work the artist chooses to show us. We're not seeing the pile of shit in the corner that it took to get that exhibition up. Yeah. 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 And, and the same goes for social media, isn't it? I mean, in all walks of life, not even just art. People yeah. are curating their life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But... Yeah. I think for me it, as well as what is resonating for me with what you're saying is that you've got to have that courage to fail time yep. and time and time and time again and go, yep, going to keep going because I know it's in there somewhere. Yeah. 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 Repetition, repetition, practice. That's why they call practicing artists because you get in there and you practice. Um, and the more you practice, the better you get. Um, but yeah, the mistakes are they offer us the biggest opportunity for learning. And I've always said there are no total failures as long as you extract the lesson that the failure teaches you. Um, so as long as you learn, for me, it's never a, a real failure. And if you're standing there sort of scratching your head going, well, I wonder if I can do this and you don't know the answer, well, just do it. That's the quickest way to find out. Mm. So be brave, be exploratory, um, and um, but be exploratory with what I call an inquiring mind and an observing mind and be willing. Sandra Brownlee, who's a Canadian tutor and textile artist, she has a lovely expression, which is look at your work in progress with with soft eyes, which is to try and look at what you're doing without judgment. You're looking with eyes that observe, and sure, they're observing the cock-ups or the things that haven't worked, but fine, you know, they didn't work. So be soft and gentle with the criticism, if you like, that, that, that you're giving yourself and be very, very specific with it. Well, you know, that doesn't really, well, that's a piece of crap, isn't it? Well, okay, fine you know, go away, critic, what makes you feel that way? Be specific. Is it the colour scheme? Is it the balance? Is it um, the directionality? Is it because it lacks um, good relationships or good contrasts? So you can actually learn to become your own coach by the quality of the questions you ask yourself while you're responding to your own work. But, but look with soft eyes. Be kind to yourself. <laughs> I think that's so beautiful and yeah. just another lesson in life, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can be given 40 compliments and one negative one and we always as women, I think, just focus on that negative one and go, but, 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 they said this and it's like, yeah. forget that. If we just focused on the 40, imagine how wonderful it would feel. And we yeah. are all perfectly imperfect. That's the oh. other one. Well, yeah. that's... So and none of, none of us are perfect. We're just perfectly imperfect. Yes, I can certainly, um, yes, yes. Yeah. I think that's certainly a sentiment to embrace during this time for sure. And I think the other thing for me would be um, I really respond to work where, where I can see evidence of the maker in it, whether that's, you know, their hand because of what they've done, but more importantly, their energy, their soul. You get a real sense of this individual when you're looking at their work and it's not about how neat you can be or how precise you can be it's it's how well you're visually communicating whatever it is you want to communicate yeah whether that's happiness sadness energy flow abstract landscape solitude stillness and silence um, it's about i don't believe you can put the energy into the work unless you're you know literally working on it and pushing it in mm, another that not, another reason not to design everything to death in a sketchbook because then you put all the bloody energy into the sketchbook you've got nothing left when you come mm. to the people oh. yeah and then you're probably co constantly comparing to that sketchbook as well and then it just adds another layer of complexity of like oh but it's not how i wanted it to be or it's not good enough or yeah it doesn't matter yeah no. Yeah. Mm. yeah art is so much about psychology i mean it's it's incredible isn't it and 
yeah, yeah just that feeling and emotion i think um mm. and because you know and that's the great thing about it you know 10 different people can look at the same artwork and each person have a completely different response to it and that's the joy of it some people will hate it and some and say you know well, my three-year-old could do that well fine um and some people will just stand there for 17 hours and be lost in it um and there's no right or no wrong there's just different and there's just learning um what you're responding to yeah, agnes martin says we must learn to know what we love about the art we look at and i mean i'm, I'm not getting this absolutely right as a quote i can't remember it perfectly um and we have to learn to understand what it is we love about our own work because that takes us one step closer to understanding who we are as, as human beings and ultimately i think that's why we're doing it it's it's self-expression mm, it's gorgeous i think everybody should find more joy in their life and follow that more yeah, yeah. Totally. totally. Yeah. Glennis has asked a question. She said, um, first of all, hello, Glennis. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, is the size of the piece important? So maybe there's two questions there, like the size of the piece, like when you're exploring or maybe what the size of the, the finished piece, maybe if that's what um, Glennis is referring yeah. to there. Thanks for that, Glennis. I... If I'm entering new media, media that's unfamiliar to me or new techniques or processes, I will go smaller. But I, if I know that ultimately, let's say I want to work a wide landscape format, so a rectangular a, in, in, in landscape, I will make sure that my um, exploratory work is done in the same format and maybe a quarter of the size so but i would rarely do exploratory work on less than anything um i don't know 50 centimeters square or 75 centimeters square partly because a if the exploratory work goes well ooh, you might have a little piece of work that you can frame or mount in some way and those are the faster sellers let's face it in an exhibition so that's the first reason but the second reason is, well, actually, there are loads of reasons. Um, second reason would be with certain techniques, your gestures might be important. You know, you're doing a sweep of a paintbrush or a whatever, and you can't be as gestural on a little tiny thing as you can be even on something 50 centimetres square, let alone two metres by one. Thirdly, I think... Something that looks good small doesn't necessarily scale up and vice versa. And I think one thing that people forget when they scale up work is when the whole piece of work gets bigger, everything in it has to get bigger. So you would, if you were using a brush, let's say, that was one inch wide on the small piece, you might have to go to a brush that's four inches wide on the large piece. So everything must scale up. When it comes to size of artwork generally, I think there's no question that larger works do offer impact. You know, let's face it, you go into a gallery and you're confronted something by something two meters square or bigger, you know, eight by four or something. Sorry, I keep switching from metric to um, uh, <laughs> imperial. Um, you know, you're going to you're going to be arrested by it um, just because of its sheer size. But I don't necessarily think that big is better. I think big is different. I also think it's about your subject matter. So my subject matter is landscape, abstract landscape. So if I'm trying to get a sense of the 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 the, the, the big vast scale of let's say the Atacama Desert, I'm not going to be able to do that on a five by seven inch piece. Yeah, it's going to be really really hard. <laughs> um, so because I work landscape, I'm generally working anywhere between. 1.5 to 2 meters wide between 80 to 1.25 
centimeters in depth. And also I have to be constrained somewhat by the space available to me in the studio. Manhandling, and I've had to do it and I haven't enjoyed it, pieces that are two meters square is, is not fun <laughs> when you get to the, the final leg of it, of finishing it and attaching everything to hang it on the wall. Um, work as big as you can, but more importantly, work as big as you enjoy working. Um, because some people don't, it's too stressful, the large stuff. Mm. Also think about, we could think about breaking landscape down into several, you know, more slender pieces that hung side by side. We could think about doing a nine by nine. So we might have, um, nine 50 centimeter square pieces but hung in a nine patch to a, to 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 make the whole work we might think about doing something that's eight meters long but only 40 centimeters wide and it goes around the gallery wall around the corner and into the next room or it travels across across the floor or it gets manipulated into some sort of sculptural form almost um so size is, 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 it's a personal choice, I think, completely personal mm. choice. Yeah. Mm. I think that's wonderful advice for people. Thank you so much. Um, Patricia said earlier, very generous with her knowledge and skills, so empathetic. And, yeah, so far, Claire, you've just been amazingly generous. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Before we get stuck into, I'd love to show you some, people that aren't familiar with your work, a couple of pieces, yeah. and maybe you could yeah. talk about it. But um, we were talking yesterday and you were, the internet was really scratchy, but you were telling me about a workshop that you've just finished and this amazing process that you took your children, uh, your children, your students on, they're like children, aren't they? <laughs> I do make them cry from time to time. <laughs> I love <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you took them on this wonderful exercise involving throwing a dice. Are you happy to share that with us? Yeah, I might, I might even have it here in front of me. Yeah. Um, it was called Seeking Change, Taking Risks, and um, Moving On. Um, and um, on the first day, they were given tasks to complete, uh, they had no choice in the matter. Um, they had to do it. They were given a big piece of cloth, roughly two meters by a meter. And the first task was you can cut it and reassemble it if you want. But if you do that, you've got to reassemble it by stitching it back together. And you've only got five minutes. So you better make those stitches big and practical and forget about being neat. Second task would say they were given a big chunky graphite stick and they had to just scribble anything that came into their heads over it. They were given two minutes for that. Third task, they were given a knife or scissors and told to cut a hole in it. Well, that caused a bit of... <laughs> um, that was fine. Then we got to the diced activity. Um, fourth task is I, I had um, a lot of... Uh, I had six options written up, and I've actually got them here. So the first one was collage. Um you can use the cutout that I made you do and cut that up and sew it back on as collage, or you can save that for something else, use other pieces of cloth and just collage, do some collage on your cloth. Um, then second thing, actually, no, before we got to, 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 to um, dice rolling, <laughs> I got them to work with some completely mad tools only in black so they were given chains to dip in quite runny i, I used acrylic that day because the weather was really bad and we'd never have got dye dry they were given chains to dip and roll or drop onto their cloth which is broomsticks mops scraps of t-shirt fabric attached to sticks feathers um scrim all sorts of stuff and they had to use pretty much everything and just make marks. Then we got to the dice. Collage was one option. Increased scale. So that was to look at a mark you'd already made. Choose a similar but 
bigger tool and try and now make that mark in a much bigger scale. They had to work with negatives. So instead of working with black paint, they were working with white or off-white paint um, to introduce light back into the piece. They had to manipulate the cloth in some way, which might involve tearing or gathering, roughing up the edge, or just kind of trying to turn it into a sculptural form temporarily. They had to monoprint on it. They had to write or scribble on it using sticks or cola pens or stuff like that. So there were six things and the order in which they did them in was determined by if they rolled a four, they started with uh, manipulation. If they rolled a three, they started by using white paint and they all got busy with this. And at the end, we went round and compared the results because the results they got obviously were very different because we're dealing with different people and different ways of using tools. Um, but also very much depended on the order they rolled the dice. So mm -hmm. somebody who rolled monoprinting, let's say, at, that was the fourth thing they did. And they'd done three other things before that got a very different result to the person who'd rolled the monoprint option as number one and then followed it up with with that um and that's quite educational because they were able to see oh well that in in this case you know that activity happened first and over here it happened third and over there it happened six and the results were incredibly different um and we then spent quite a lot of time looking for those amazing, delicious areas and saying, well, okay, so if we wanted to just take that, I don't know, 40 centimeter area and now increase it in scale, we've actually got some clues here as to the order in which we need to do things in. They were also allowed uh, a restricted palette of six colors on top of the black and white or off-white they were using. Um, and we went on to um, we went on to do overworking or what I call erasure, obliteration, subtraction. Because a lot of the times we add things, we, you know, we add another mark, we add another mark, we add another mark. And the business of subtraction is about saying, well, I've now got a lot of black and, and a lot of whatever my color palette is on my cloth. I'm actually now going to obscure some of that. What's the background color I've got? Well, I started on cream cloth, so I'm gonna use cream paint. If they really want to obliterate and introduce what I call the void or the real space of calm in the work, they could choose completely opaque paint and literally paint it out. They could use a template to do that, do it in shapes, do a section. And if they wanted to partially obscure what was underneath obviously they could make that paint more transparent in the same way that you'd add print paste to dye paste paint to make it more transparent and paint it out and that was actually quite extraordinary in a couple of examples because of course with all these tasks and i'm telling them you're going to be jumping off, off a cliff you know letting go of outcome because we're all very, very attached to outcome, aren't we? Let's face it, mm. we all want it to work the first, you know, every piece we do is going to be a masterpiece and exhibitable and no, it's not like that at all. <laughs> um, so it's just, just do it, just do it and see what evolves. And it was quite interesting because at a certain point I could look at people and I could see the attachment to this crazy piece of work on the, on the bench was 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 building and and suddenly mm. it was becoming precious and suddenly they were like oh my god you know i'm now being asked to do this to it and mm, i don't really want to and no you do it you do it and i had eight people seven of the eight people got that piece to a, a finished result it was quite extraordinary and the person who didn't 
didn't only because she took extreme risks with it and actually and the, the bits of the piece of cloth she started with ended up being tools to make marks on the, you know another piece of work she started so it, it was fun it was a lot of fun that sounds fantastic a lot yeah. of people are saying yeah exactly the same thing well, yeah like I've, um uh, from there we went to explore lots and lots as the week progressed. So that, that kind of took us a day and a half. But as the week uh, went on, I began to introduce, well, you could do this and you can consider that and you can consider the other. And I think sometimes we're faced with so many options. We, we freeze, we don't know what, to, oh shit, don't know what to do. <laughs> now, if that happens to you, if you've got six possible ways forward with this piece, well, write them down, number them, get the dice, roll it, and do whatever it tells you to do. It's remarkably relaxing because the decision, you've done the work of coming up with the ideas or possibilities, but the business of making the decision as to which one you do or which order you do them in is completely random. But I, I will email you, um, I've got it all here. I'll email you, if you like, the, um, the tasks and the instructions. Oh, really? <laughs> People can give it a go, you know, at home. Um, oh, that's so generous. Yeah. <laughs> they were so. all working much more gesturally when the weather cleared. We would, we, <laughs> Janet took a piece of work outside that she, you know, applied paint to by slapping it with T-shirt fabric attached to a stick in three different colours. And before it was dry, we then got a bucket of water and threw it over it, which is what um, an artist called... Uh, somebody Ray R A E does, and it was great. We rolled it up, stamped on it, unrolled it, let it dry. Crazy, yeah, love it. We all got to let go a little bit, don't we? And just hang, yeah. hang loose, and yeah. don't and be I afraid thought, to look a bit silly. Create something silly. <laughs> yeah, it's just one day, one week, yeah. one year. Just go nuts. Just mm. go absolutely nuts. Yeah. And you have a face over there. Yeah, we do. There is no excuse. Yeah. There's really no excuse. We could. Yeah. I've, I've really wanted to, to get outside and do some crazy stuff outside, maybe get a big piece of cloth. And I've been inspired a lot by Lorna Crane's work, and she mm -hmm. takes some big cloth outside and just lets loose with her natural brushes, and she's very instinctual. And, yeah, yeah I was lucky enough to spend some time with her, and it's just yeah. that passion and that um, instinct to be around people that have that is very freeing. It's yeah. almost contagious. Yeah. It's a beautiful That's experience. The work of Simon Callery, C-A-L-L-E-R-Y. He's a fine artist with a textile sensibility. He uses a sewing machine. How exciting is that? <laughs> he, he seeks his marks by laying the cloth down on the ground and feeling it and drawing it and then he does all sorts of other stuff simon calorie really good okay well I'll look him up i haven't heard so thank you so much yeah. Yeah. yeah now i think i know the answer to this question but I, I will, i'll ask it anyway on joe's joe's behalf but she said she was very lucky to complete a workshop with you in ballarat based on text and breakdown printing and she loves your style of workshop got that and and absolutely is i have given up international teaching Mm -hmm. um because i'm my carbon foot well when my husband and i calculated our joint carbon footprint half of that joint carbon footprint was my flights to teach and i am a member of extinction rebellion i feel quite passionately that unless we do something to slow down or ideally halt um, the climate crisis, my grandchildren are literally going to be fighting for their lives. I believe that. So the easiest way for us to immediately reduce our carbon footprint was to give up long haul flights. So uh, yeah, I'm lucky. I've been to the Atacama Desert in Chile. I've been to New Mexico. I've been to Australia. I've been to um, you know, other far fun places, Sri Lanka. Um, 
but I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'll have to look for the remote places in England, and there are there are, there are plenty of them. Um, so I was committed to teach at Nancy Crow's until I said I would carry on teaching with her until the end of 2021. I've rolled that out until 2022 because I couldn't go this year. But uh, after that, no, I'll teach in England and that's it. So sorry, but no. It, my carbon footprint on my flights was just like horrible. Yeah. And I know it's different for you guys in a place like Australia because you're, you know, 150,000 bigger than us. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, a long haul is inevitable just get, to get from one side of the country to the other. But I don't have to do it. So um, I choose not to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fantastic. And you've got support, um, you know, thank you for your commitment to the future of our children and grandchildren in the world. Yeah. They will inherit. And, um, yeah, of course, Madeline, yeah, it, it is it is sad for us. Um, but, you know, the world's getting smaller now with the internet and online learning. And so there are, there will be, you but there'll be opportunities to learn from you, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I did a I did a live Zoom demonstration through um, the Festival of Quilts. Um, when was that? End of July, something like that. And I had 448 people watching the dem and doing it at the same time. So it is all possible. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It is all possible. Yeah. One thing when I heard about you not flying to teach anymore, and, and I don't mean to be controversial when I ask this, but I, I'm just interested in your thought process about it is how do you feel about people flying to you now to get to you as students? Well, like uh, When I wrote to my American students, many of whom have been with me for years, I had um, several requests to make of them. And the first was, you do not fly to me, mm. particularly en masse, because that would be worse than me flying to you mm. yeah um and um the other thing i said to them is actually they're all big enough and ugly enough to approach nancy and say you know as a group we want to hire the barn we want to do independent study you know you know us you trust us to lead the place in in, in good nick um and um you know that they, they can do that they're all perfectly capable of helping each other out with with technique and process they're all perfectly capable of you know as a group doing reviews of work in progress and critiques and you know constructive criticism and ideas for way they're all perfectly capable of it and sometimes i do think that when you've got the tutor there your own brain kind of goes, oh, I well, don't have to think anymore, yeah? Mm. And, 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 and I don't mean that to sound harsh, and I, and I don't really sort of mean it as a criticism, but we can get overly dependent on tu students, you know, uh, sorry, on tutors, um, to the point where we've got to educate, we've got to keep our own brains working, we've got to keep those synaptic responses firing up you you use it or you lose it um mm. so I, I i think there's a lot that people can do in small groups the key thing is to establish what i call the safe space a place where people trust each other can be honest with each other and um cry if necessary, laugh, you know, have a kit for 20 minutes under your table. Whatever you're doing is kind of accepted on the basis that we're all just different people and we tackle things in our own way. Mm. That's beautiful advice. Become your, think, own, tutors. Yeah. Become your own tutors. You, you, every, you can all do it. You can all do it. It's hard, but it's possible. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Madeline just asked, is the, the Festival of Quilts still available? 
Uh, they called it Beyond Festival of Quilts. So they ran it virtually with online galleries. So I think if you Google Beyond Festival of Quilts or Festival of Quilts, a lot of it will potentially still be online. I don't know if the demonstrations and lectures are still available. You'd, I've no idea um, because I don't need to watch myself. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but yeah, just Google it and, and I think you'll find it. Yeah, I think my my lovely husband in the background is having a Google now. So if he finds it, he'll pop a yeah. link up in the description. Yeah, yeah he's, he's yeah. giving me a thumbs up. So he's found it, Madeline. So he'll put a link up. Yeah. Yeah. We better show some people your work because otherwise they might get a bit grumpy. <laughs> but this is a safe place, people. <laughs> you can so, grumpy if you like. <laughs> yeah, you can get grumpy at us. That's okay. Now, I'd love to show people some of your desert scapes. I, I call them desert scapes. Mm -hmm. your, and it would be remiss of me not to ask you about your process and, and your body of work that came out from being out in that desert and I just, I just love, love a good desert. So we're a bit spoiled there. So if we never get to travel again as well, we've got plenty of deserts here. But um, the ones you've been to. The whole world in Australia, geographically speaking, topographically. We really do. Yeah. We, we're, we're quite spoiled. We're yeah. very spoiled. We, I do love our country. Yeah. Um, so I just want to show a couple of um, images of, of this gorgeous landscape and, and then maybe some of the work that was inspired by that. Yeah. Um, this one's very much about just the colour. That's the raw earth pigment, you know. Mm. And I've, I've done a couple of pieces, yeah. That's, uh, what's it called? Lunar Valley, that is, Lunar Valley. And the white is salt, not snow. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. And then um, the salt plains. This is the salt flats, yeah. I just love Gorgeous. those birds in a row. Uh, yeah. Now, I've got a whole collection of your work here um, mm -hmm. to go through, but we don't have to go through all of it. So some of the – I'll just, just pick out a few key ones that, that maybe spoke to me and then hopefully you'll mm -hmm. be able to talk a little bit about it. Um, and I'm not sure if they came from your time at, at, in the desert or whether they came from your time in other places, but because I didn't name them properly, I apologise. Well, remote is um, remote at the end of the day. You know, yeah. They kind of all overlap. Yeah. So this one here was one that really spoke to me. It was um, the plateau. Yep. That Where is that one. Plateau. That is on the plateau looking down. So I'm standing on the plateau. I'm actually looking behind me. I'm not looking down into Death Valley. And there were some very, very weird lilac-y, I don't know how to describe that colour, to be quite honest. And so that one was very much about a little bit of crustiness on the ground because of the, the ever-present salt. Um, you know, the, the horizon lines I could see in the diff distance and just the texture because the light kept changing all the time. We were in the Atacama when it was surprisingly rainy. Um, and so there would be a lot of clouds scudding about and then sunshine. And actually that was brilliant because the landscape constantly changed in terms of the values you were seeing and the colors you're seeing. Mm, that was gorgeous, yeah. and the red, the Red Rock River. That was uh, based on the. Our hotel was actually cut off from the road um, because we had such heavy afternoon and and overnight rainfalls that the river flooded, and directly opposite our hotel window, there was a, a, a dark, dark orange uh, escarpment or cliff face. Um, with the river sort of rushing along in front of it, so that that was just that was that was a lucky win. Uh, that actually started as a breakdown printing demonstration, which came good. <laughs> Mother no, you've got to take those lucky wins. You've got to take them. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, this one here, the colours in this are are, are gorgeous and. Did you name it Tot We Can? We can What's this uh, one called? This is um, We Cannot Drink. There's a there's one before it called They Poisoned the Well. This one was actually based on the Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico. And the the, um, the Pueblo is 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 sits very high on a mesa. And when the Spanish came in to conquer, 
um, the First Nations retreated to their high ground and the way the Spanish got them was ultimately they poisoned the well. Um, so they had to then come down. Um, so the mm -hmm. colours in that are um, a rather disgustingly expensive um, natural blue cobalt, um, mm. a bit of natural black um, to get to get the colour I wanted. So the idea with the red line is that this this poison is sort of stopping them from drinking. Um, mm. It's a bit, uh, I was telling you today about Melbourne and we're having our water cut off because of the storms last night. We're not allowed to drink the water either. <laughs> Maybe that's why I like that one so much today. Yeah. Yeah. But this watering hole one, which is full, is just speaks to me as well. This, I could I could look at this one forever. Yeah, I. Uh, that's on tour in the States at the moment. That was my first view of the valley that, the flat top mountain or mesa that the Acamo Pueblo is on top of, you know, it sits within this valley. And I was quite astonished to see a watering hole. It didn't have much water in it, but nonetheless, mm. it was a watering hole. Mm. It's in beautiful, beautiful colours. Yeah. The colours are very much based on the colour of the, the desert there. Not yeah. quite. And and 170 degrees, this this looks like a, a three-dimensional piece. No, it's not. 170 degrees refers to um, its longitudinal, I think, um, geographical mm -hmm. location. And it's very difficult to see on this. Um, it was a sod to photograph. A lot of my work <laughs> is. But there are a lot of blue threads Lead, couch threads leading in from the top of the piece and the right and the bottom. There you go. And this little stitched area here is my representation of the Pueblo. Um, it was pretty much that shape. I based the shape on an aerial Google shot um, of the Pueblo. And the little stitch marks are sort of denoting all the mud huts, the, the wattle and door adobe buildings. Yeah, mm. I, I wasn't expected. That was supposed to go on tour in America, and I showed it in Germany and sold it. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's great. Great for the person that owns 3D. it. I think they look three D because the way I attach is Velcro um, stitched onto tape, which is then stitched onto the back of the piece. So the piece hangs off a wooden stick and I can actually make that a little bit thicker so it hangs off the wall a bit and then you get that shadow. Ah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I felt like in that one as well there was um, like a line in the middle that almost looked like, yeah, it, it was... There were two, um, two pieces. It's two pieces. Two uh, pieces. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah that's good. gorgeous. I'm just having a look at... Um, in your work, do you start by painting the cloth first or stitch, then paint? Generally, I I paint, then stitch, but often I'll then paint over that stitch. There is yeah. something rather delicious about paint on top of stitch. It can be a bit scary. Um, I did do one, which I, 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 I might have sent you a photograph of it, where I did about a month's worth of hand stitching all over it, and then I scraped heavy body um pigment over the top of it and when that was dry I took an electric sander to it um nice I did one small sample first and then went for it um yeah. the paint on top of stitch is fantastic and yeah. somehow it embeds it into the work rather than it being a sort of surface you know thing an afterthought it was like it was always there yeah and I think that's that's pretty key because I think we all fall into the trap of saying, well, you know, I'm going to stitch it now. Well, are you? Does it need it? Will it move it forward? Um, you know, if you're desperate to hand stitch, but the piece you're working on does not need it, well, go and hand stitch something else. You know, don't stitch for the sake of it. Only stitch <laughs> that stitch is truly going to be part of the piece and move it forward and do whatever it needs to do. Yeah. Oh, incredible advice. Incredible yeah. advice. Yeah. Stitching through the stiffened work is a bit of a penance, but 
So it tends to be more accent rather than the, 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 the main course, so to speak. Yeah. Glennis reminded me to say that um, you've actually got a book about your work that's available through yeah. your website. Yeah. yeah. And that goes into more detail about about each piece and, and, and the origins of it. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Yeah. And, and the hand stitch, exclusively hand stitch stuff I do, which is kind of, that's the meditation. Um, and that's that's the, the reward of stitching soft fabrics rather than stiff fabrics. Yeah. Yeah. Great. A couple more questions. I know no, we've been going almost an hour, so I appreciate your time and, and thank you, everyone, for um, for tuning in as well. I wanted to ask you about what you've been doing during lockdown because lockdown. you were talking. Thank you. Lockdown has been a blessing for I you, Claire. I had eight weeks, 12 weeks, uninterrupted time in my studio in my life. I was due to go to um, southern Spain for a residency, two-week residency in a totally eco site. So reed bed systems and solar this and wind that. So I thought, right, well, I can't use acrylics. And um, I'd already begun to question, and in fact, I wrote a blog about this. I think it's my last one, I can't remember. Um, I began to question the plastic content in the acrylics. And I don't want to get too eco-warrior, but I also want to try and be a bit more conscious. So I thought, right, well, I know that I, I've done it. I can bind the earth pigments to the cloth using homemade soya milk. So that's what I'll do. And I'll do lots of experiments and do stuff directly on the land. It was high desert, so perfect place for me. Then oh, lockdown, can't go, no problem stick to that plan so i decided to work with soy milk and earth pigments to color them up turn them into soy paint uh, until i kind of ran out of things to do so it was quite process led it was like well use every surface design technique you know try this try that and i did a bit of research um about the soy milk and adapted things a bit and experimented a bit and I ended up doing about 32, 34 exploratory pieces, some of which were 50 centimetres. On average, they were probably about 1 metre 25 by, yeah, whatever. So this is white pigment, something called, I only know the French for work because it's a French pigment I buy. It's called Blanc de Merdon. You have to use a lot of it. Um, but it's it's using the fact that the pigments are heavy and can sit in and settle um, onto the cloth. So this is uh, Ikea linen, linen from Ikea, which I admittedly, the I'm pointing at as if you can see me pointing at it. <laughs> it's a, what I call a donut shape, the ring. I the, That's the Ikea linen, which I pre-coloured by soaking in tannin overnight. And then I actually took it to a very, very weak ferrous or iron um, mordant bath, which changed it to that whatever colour you want to call it, mauvey, brownie, taupey colour. Um, but, yeah, I'm very excited by by that. Yeah, lot, you can do, you can thicken soy paint. It's amazing. You, you, your basic first step is you pre-treat the cloth with soy milk. Um, I just paint it on, let it sit for an hour, then I wring it out, and then I either work, I mainly work with it, wrung out damp and it is quite extraordinary even working with liquid soy paint on damp what's called pre-sized soy cloth you get very little bleed and if you let the the the, the, the first treatment of soy dry and then go at it with liquid soy paint you don't get any bleed at all you can use cola pens you can use you can you can draw incredibly fine lines, um, and you can thicken it. Um, I haven't tried thickening it with sodium alginate yet, but I 
I have done it successfully with Tragacant gum. Um, so it's it, it certain thing, it doesn't have the glue ability of an acrylic, so I can't go back to old practices of ripping bits of the concrete floor off um, with my acrylic paint. Um, but it'll do most things. You can break down printing. You can do break down printing with it. Um, it's extraordinary. I actually wrote a book because um, I kept quite detailed notes and typed them up and thought, oh, I've got 70, I've got 70 pages with the pictures. So I'm actually talking to a publisher at the moment and seeing if they'll publish for me. If they, if they won't, then I might self-publish. But the soy is great. It's beans. You soak them the night before. You mush them up with water. Um, everything. The soy milk, the soy pulp, I can throw it in the field. I can throw it in the compost heap. Um, the soy paint, it's just got soy milk and, and dirt in it. I can throw that in the field if I want to. It's all completely biodegradable. It's extraordinary. Really extraordinary. Okay. That's exciting. I can't yeah. wait to read that book if, when it comes out. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Susan's asked, I'm curious about the name of Claire's blog, her quiet materials and the implicit reference of his dark materials. Yeah. It's, that series uh, not a, it's not an inspiration. I really admire his writing. Um, and, um, yeah, it was just a, it, it was a nod, if you like. I thought, well, his materials are dark. Mine are very quiet. Perfect. Yeah. Madeline's asked, does soy commercial? No, 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 no. You've got to make your own. It's got too many additives, too many preservatives in it. It's been messed about with. So don't just make your own. It could not be simpler. Great. I will send you the recipe for basic soy milk and then you're on your own until the book comes out. <laughs> you're giving it all away. <laughs> Nobody will... Nobody can make my work and I can't make their work. So what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. The I think that that's very, very, very important. A um, yeah. couple more questions just quickly. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to artists out there listening or anyone that re-watches this? Um, how best do they make better environmental choices when it comes to their artwork? So if they're a mixed media artist or if they're a textile artist, I mean, I, mean, I know the spectrum's huge, but you know, in layman's terms, for the people just getting more environmentally conscious about their artwork, what advice would you give them? I would say if you're using acrylics, work really hard to minimise the amount you're sending into the water system because um, that's how the sort of nanoparticles of plastic ultimately end up in the rivers or the oceans. If you've got acrylic paint to dispose of, you would get, you know, a a container bigger a small bucket and you well first of all I keep a dump pot lidded because that turns into colors that it might take me my entire life to mix if I had to think about it um, but the best way is all all excess paint you know scrape it off your brushes scrape it out your pots dump it into a wide container wide mouth container and leave it with the lid off let it evaporate because once the water content's gone you can peel it off as a sheet of plastic and it's possible you can recycle it can go into the recycling bin worst case is it goes into landfill but at least it doesn't get into the water system um but try not to waste too much of it you know mm. oils are no better really because they're using all sorts of nasty products to clean up your brushes with there's no soy milk is the purest i can get to and obviously all the eco printing and stuff like that the natural dyeing but ultimately we have to do what we have to do and i asked in my xr group there's a guy who's you know scientists and petrochemicals and blah blah and he said actually when we look at the fossil fuel extraction that happens on the planet the percentage of fossil fuels that are actually used in plastics is incredibly small, incredibly small. Um, so the biggest issue is um, using it as fuel, um, the emissions and stuff like that. But just just be careful and, and try not to waste too much. Um, you know, hopefully my work as and when it gets bought 
will enjoy a good period of time up on the wall, but I accept that whatever I make it out of, whether it's soy milk or acrylic or dye, sooner or later, somebody might end up in a landfill site. And there's no bugger all I can do about that. I'll be dead. But it's not <laughs> going to be making my art. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Good advice. Yeah. Now, we always ask at the end of our interviews if there's something that you would like to say or a quote or something that you would like to be remembered for as an artist, what would that be? Ooh. I I think they're different things. Um, you know, what I want to be remembered for as an artist is to create work that um, that enables the viewer to find peace in some way, shape or form, and enables the viewer to experience the grandeur and awe we have when we are out in what I call big nature. Um, in terms of advice, it would be to plant your bowl deep. And by that, I mean, dig deep, you know, you're not going to get an attractive looking flower by just chucking the bowl on the ground. You have to dig the hole, you have to do the work. And that it's when you do that, when you plant your bulbs deep, that's when your work has resonance, in my opinion, because it's got your physical energy in it, your emotional energy in it, your spiritual energy in it, and your mental energy in it. Um, plant your bulb deep, look with soft eyes, and always extract the learning from every failure. Then it's not a failure, in my opinion. Thank you so much, Claire. <laughs> Talking to you tonight, it's been such a privilege. So we really, really, really appreciate it. And yeah, we look forward we'll to, to, we'll to, you know, level two. Yeah. 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 Love to. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely love to do it again for sure. I think there's so much that you've got to offer. And um, there's obviously so much inspiration there as well. So thank you so much. And we're going to play a little slideshow now. And everybody who's watching, thank you so much for tuning in yeah, and listening to Claire tonight. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And please, yeah, pop in the comments, say thank you to Claire, and we'll play a slideshow for her and so she can see um, your messages of gratitude. So thank you once again, Claire. Thank you.